Hi, my name is Bill Merkline, and I am a commercial sculptor who worked for Hasbro, which is the reason that we're doing this tape. Let me just um, tell you a little bit about what led up to the making of this recording, and that is that a few months ago, I was contacted by a gentleman named Gary Head, who is in the area of uh, Chicago, Illinois, and he is a collector and an authority on the subject of G.I. Joe's. So he was um, quite uh, excited on the phone to have finally located me because apparently there had been uh, a, a attempts to locate me and it's been difficult. So sorry about that, Gary, but glad to be here now. So in the course of, of time with Gary, he came out to Connecticut where we're shooting this right now and uh, there was a G.I. Joe convention uh, a couple of months ago, I believe. We're shooting this now at the end of July in 2010. So it's been a, a bit uh, since I saw Gary, but Gary made a trip out here uh, from Hartford Airport, from uh, Bradley Field, and drove down here to meet me. And he came along with a friend, Josh, and we set out um, material that I had saved from my working days at Hasbro and this was just wonderful for these guys and I have to say it was wonderful for, for me because in all the years of uh, commercial sculpting and all the projects that I've been able to work on and many of them have been very high profile I have never seen the amount of gratification for work that I've done as I saw from these two young gentlemen so uh, Gary, in the course of time, had also said that people were sending in uh, questions for me on the Internet. And of course, most of you probably know by now that I'm not on the Internet, which unfortunately is a very uh, deliberate action on my part. Uh, I should say, because I always have to explain this, that I spend my time painting and sculpting. And the, the computer for me is a part of my life, but it's not used for that kind of purpose. I need the time for painting and sculpting. So here I have a list of questions that were submitted by, I guess, a variety of people. And I'm going to try to um, remember what I can and give you some uh, answers to these questions. Well, the first question is, are you coming out of retirement? Well, let me tell you, I've never been in retirement. Uh, the job is, is too much fun. I'm a painter and a sculptor and always have been. So the idea of retiring is uh, just something that is not in my game plan. It's, as I said, it's just too much fun. The second question is, did you want to be a toy maker or did you just fall into the line of work? What, what were his ambitions in the art world, etc.? What type of design dash art do you do? Well, that's, that's a lot of things. Okay, um, no, I, I never planned to be a toy maker uh, except to make things that were of interest to me. And uh, life just has a tendency sometimes to pick you up with the wind and blow you into directions that turn out to be absolutely fascinating. And this has certainly been true in this case. We'll get into that uh, probably on, on the next question. What were my ambitions in the art world? My ambitions began when I was a child, and uh, I was turned on to art at a very young age, and serious art, uh, fine art. And what my ambitions uh, in art had to do with several things that um, happened in my youth that made me un insatiably curious about being a fine art painter. Sculpting was something that I also did as a child, but it was play for me. Uh, and uh, painting was my, my holy grail. It still is my holy grail. So it's kind of fun to think that the thing that I played with uh, became a career, and the thing that is a holy grail is still out there, and I'm still searching for it. All right, let's see. How did you start working for Hasbro? All right, well, where to begin this story? Um, things don't happen in predictable sequences of events in real life. They become unpredictable things. So I'm going to get through the 
first part of the story as quickly as I can. And that is that I'd always been fascinated by uh, model building and aviation, aviation and ships history, very uh, big thing for me. And my best friend and I had been uh, building model airplanes with a group of modelers that used to meet at Polk's Hobbies uh, twice a week. Uh, Polk's Hobbies no longer exists, but it was the world's largest hobby shop. And it was uh, in New York City in Manhattan. So one day, uh, after, oh, 15 or more years of learning everything you want to know about aviation, you get pretty satiated. And one day, Ron came in, and he had with him an airfix kit of a Coldstream Guard, which was not an airplane. It was actually a, a model of a human being from the Napoleonic Wars. And suddenly, I realized that there's something very fascinating in this, in as much as that the history of aviation is a very brief history, uh, um, airplanes, powered airplanes beginning at, at the beginning of the 20th century. And this was a much broader subject to look at the costume and, um, you know, first of all, it was a military costume, but uh, covering the whole history of humanity from the ancient times to the modern period was, was wonderful and it was something brand new to learn. So I immediately got hold of one of these airfix kits of a cold stream, stream guard and decided to turn it into an American Civil War figure. In this case, it was a Berdan sharpshooter. So that is what we call a conversion. But Ron and I were doing conversions for a while, and then I started to scratch build to, to create models, and I was using styrene plastic because I didn't know other materials at that time. Now, this is getting a little bit more long-winded than I wanted to, but let's make the leap to the toy companies. I had become, because of these uh, figures that I had shown in, in hobby shows, um, I'd become known for my work, and I began to be hired to do uh, work that could be reproduced as kits. The person who first hired me was um, Lube Babiak of Gateway Hobbies, and he pursued me for a full year to do some figures in 135th scale for some Tamiya tanks, and he was interested in the Vietnam era. So when these figures were finally done for him and they came on the market, I had a call from Philip Stearns, who was an editor with uh, Campaigns Magazine, who lived in New York and wanted to meet me. And at that time, I had just um, completed my first uh, painting show and had gotten a very good commission out of that show and had done much better than I imagined I would be able to do. But I realized um, that making a living in the arts was going to be extremely difficult. I pretty much had a sense of that well before it. But uh, this is not a career that one chooses by choice. You really have to be dropped on your head several times as an infant. What Philip uh, told me was so encouraging, he was so excited about the work that I was doing because since I was totally ignorant of the hobby that he was involved with, I didn't realize that there were certain innovations of thinking that I was bringing to my work, which had to do with a hobby that was primarily static at that time. And here I was introducing the idea of motion and personality into these figures in 1 35th scale, which makes them just a little bit over two inches or about 50 millimeters in, in height. Uh, from there, Philip had put me in touch with a number of companies to uh, do work with, and that was great because I figured this would help pay the rent while I was doing painting commissions. In the course of time, I had a call from a man named Bill Murray, who was in our hobby, but he also worked for the Knickerbocker Toy Company, and he had a project that he thought I would be very good for. And at that time, Knickerbocker was owned by Warner Brothers, the film company, and they were starting production on a fantasy film, fantasy science fiction film, that was influenced by both Star Wars and Dragon Slayer. And so this was to be a combination of those two elements. This is 1982, I believe. And so I was asked if I could sculpt the portrait figures, the action figures that would represent the actors, 
Ron Hynote, who was also in the field of making military miniatures, was brought on board to sculpt the monsters and the creatures, although I also got to uh, sculpt the principal villain of the piece, a kind of science fiction monster character. So this was my introduction. And in those sculpts, <clears throat> I was sculpting them to what we call one-to-one -one size, which means that when you look at a G.I. Joe figure, uh, that's the same height as the crawl line. And so that was the movie Crawl. And uh, so I sculpted them one-to-one. -one. In the course of, of doing this, the film was being produced, and um, I was working from costume shots with, uh, uh, that they would send me for the actors. And Warner Brothers was not pleased with the way the movie was going. They felt it was not going to be a successful film, and so they decided not to waste any more time. And we had finished all the sculpting masters, but they never came to fruition. So from there, we moved on to another project. And also about that time, I was contacted by a company in Chicago um, that was doing Dungeons and Dragons. So in point of fact, that the first toy of mine that I ever saw produced was a uh, character from Dungeons and Dragons called a Dragoon. And uh, what followed then was that with a couple of projects for Knickerbocker, they went under. Um, they were not doing well financially and uh, they just went out of business. So in a very short time, I had a phone call.